Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this worship service for the third Sunday in Lent. And as you may see in the bulletins, there is an insert. It is for you to put on your fridge or wherever you need to remember it, that uh, next Sunday we start daylight time. And so, of course, if you have your alarm set with your phone, that's going to figure itself out automatically. Uh, but, as it says, you snooze, you lose. And uh, the benefit, of course, is it will be light in the evening, a little longer. The downside is you lose an hour of sleep next Saturday night. So, uh, otherwise, we have uh, maybe showers this afternoon at 2. The other service times are the normal ones. Uh, men's work day is next Saturday, and uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's there's uh, nothing really out of the ordinary with the, the schedule. Uh, we've got Ascension in Huntsville. They will have the St. Louis uh, Seminary uh, Touring Choir on the 16th at five, if anybody's interested in a choir uh, singing event. And uh, otherwise, for the sermon today, the title is Where is God? And it's talking about uh, the uh, gospel text and how it relates to us, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And we're gonna look at what was really going on. First of all, why is the temple there? What was going on? And what motivated Jesus to create a whip of cords and, and go commando uh, uh, in the temple and drive the, the money changers and all those folks out? What was it that was going on that was desecrating the holy place? And what does that say about how God wants to dwell with us and where we think our God is? and how the relationship uh, between us and God means something for our lives. So that is the focus for today. So uh, with that in mind, we begin with the opening hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made Amen. heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only begotten Son to die for each and every one of you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of that same Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen upon me. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For zeal for your house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. steadfast faith, to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or is that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land, that the Lord your God is giving you. 
You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world, for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Praise God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and you, will you raise it up in three days? <coughs> but he was speaking about the temple of his body. <coughs> when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture, and the word that Jesus had spoken. This Praise is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <coughs> Together we confess the <coughs> Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 206. <coughs> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things to be visible and invisible. In the Lord and Lord of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the God and His Father before all worlds. God, our God, light of light, really God of great God, begotten not made, and the one such as with the Father, by whom all things were made. And for our sin, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and every day he rose again 
according to the scriptures, and is set in heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again for it, judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. And I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon is, Where is your God? It's, of course, based on our gospel text, John 2. Who do you like to hang out with? For example, if you lived in a subdivision with a homeowner's association, would you invite the neighborhood snitch over for drinks? Would the reason for doing that be self-interest to get on someone's good side? What if that person reported you and cost you a lot of money in fines and expenses? Would they be invited to the 4th of July barbecue? Throughout the Bible, God tells his people that their house is where he wants to dwell with them. God wants to be with his people because they fear, love, and trust in him above all things. That's the explanation uh, that Luther gives for the first commandment. God does not want to be with other people groups that serve foreign gods. This language begins in Exodus chapter 29, verses 45 to 46. We hear God repeat it in Deuteronomy chapters 12 through 19. And he repeats it a lot in those chapters. Also, chapter 26 and chapter 30. Here, chapter 16 in particular, Passover connects with the dwelling of the name of the Lord, the mercy that God offers his people, and the land that God gives to them as he fulfills his covenant with Abraham. Yet in 2 Samuel 7, verse 2, 1 Kings 8, verse 27, and 1 Chronicles 6, verse 18, we see a discussion about God dwelling in a temple. And here especially we listen to Solomon say that no temple built by hands, human hands, is truly fit for God. Ezra 6, verse 12, again mentions the name of the Lord dwelling in the rebuilt temple. Jeremiah and Ezekiel talk about life in God's land being tied to his mercy, yet being lost due to sin and unrepentance. Ezekiel and Zechariah speak of an eternal dwelling with God. Colossians chapter 1 ties this dwelling of God to Jesus Christ, whose union of divine and human natures in one person is the closest, the individual, uh, indivisible dwelling of God and man. And this is offered to us through the gospel in Colossians chapter 3. In Revelation 13, the political beast blasphemes God and those who dwell with him in heaven. Finally, as we read in Revelation 21, God dwells eternally with his people. So God wants us to be guests in his house. Not only guests, but family. The gospel text shows us the desecration of the temple. Most cultures throughout history have erected shrines or temples of some kind. These structures signify and define a holy space. This space must remain ceremonially clean, as we see in Exodus and Leviticus. 
these places indicate one or more important events. They define a place where people come close to the object of veneration and also closer to one another. This practice is older than recorded history. Shrines and temples have locations with precise and significant meaning. Jerusalem had been a Canaanite stronghold until King David conquered it, yet the temple was not a sign of David's greatness. Solomon may have been great, but after him Israel and Judah started a 400-year race to the bottom, which got there around 600 B.C. Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt the temple, a dim echo of its former glory. Nevertheless, the former exiles gathered around the altar of God at Pesach, which is Passover, Shavuot, or Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. The ark was gone by this point in time, and so they replaced it with the stone from the holy place at Bethel in the former land of Israel. The lesson that every pious Jewish person knew at Jesus' time was that the temple was the place where God came to his people and chose to do chesed, grace, upon them. It did not matter how the temple looked. It mattered that God chose to dwell there and love his people. That's what made the temple great. Along came Herod the Great. He had served Rome well in several capacities. Herod became a clever and talented king, but he was not good. He was of mixed Arab lineage. He was known for his brutality, even condemned by the Sanhedrin while he was still a private citizen. The Roman Senate declared him to be king of Judea around 39 B.C. Herod conveniently switched sides in political struggles thereafter, had several family members killed or exiled, and lived a life of debauchery. So around 19 B.C., he started to rebuild and expand both the Temple and the Temple Mount, giving us the Western Retaining Wall that we know as the Wailing Wall today. Herod was a thug used by Rome to maintain power. He rebuilt the temple and gave the priests much power and prestige so that they would have his back. This new temple might have looked good, but it had a lot of dubious purposes about it. God had meant to dwell with his people in order to shower them with his grace. Herod and the priests had turned this place into a theater where the people suffered instead. They suffered financially due to the crooked money changers, and they suffered in general because the temple was yet another place where the Roman boot came down heavily upon them. So in John chapter 2, Jesus, the God of this very temple itself, became real angry. The wedding at Cana, which John records right before our text, shows Jesus using divine power to show great love on people, even in everyday things. But at the temple, people's spiritual life and death were on the line. That was what the sacrifices that took away sin were all about. And the priests were extorting the people while denying them their grace, the grace that God wanted to do to them. So Jesus answered to the priests that he will raise up the temple in three days is echoed by Psalm 89, verses 35 to 36. Once for all, I have sworn my holiness. I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me. This inheritance comes to us through the pure preaching of the gospel and the proper administration of the sacraments. Paul writes, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. 
For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, verses 9 through 11. Again, the writer to the Hebrews mentions how Jesus became the true sacrifice once and for all. Hebrews 7, verse 27, 9, verses 12 and 26, and 10, verse 10. Judah, the brother of Jesus, speaks of the faith that we receive from Jesus as having been given to us once for all. Jude 1, verse 3. In other words, the temple was there for God to bless his people until he sent his son. There can never be another temple besides Christ. And all who look for something else look in vain and will not be saved. Rather, they will suffer eternal death. There is only one God and there is only one Christ whose sacrifice on the cross for us has covered our sins once and for all. Just as Jesus was glad to help the family at Cana, so he was quick to be angry with the priests who did not help his own beloved people. The powerful and greedy priestly class in Judea still dis dis desecrated the, the temple with their corruption until the Romans raised it for all time in A.D. 69 to 70. Then the followers of Islam built the Dome of the Rock, which has ties in it to Abraham, to the Bethel Stone, and to Muhammad. The era of the temple made by human hands is over. For us, this is good news, indeed, because it makes certain that we receive grace here today. Peter writes, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. If still there were a need for a Jerusalem temple, then we could not guarantee grace among us when we preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. As Jesus knew then and as we read now, he is the true temple. He is where we find grace. He makes himself present for us here today because he loves being with his people. As you come up to this altar to receive the Lord's holy body and blood, our Lord invites you to his place now. Yet, either when we die or when the world ends, he will invite us, his people, to his place forever. We were just as bad as that neighborhood snitch. Our sins were as unclean as scarlet blood. But his blood has washed us clean, and we are his family now and forever. And the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith, even unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God on earth, in Christ Jesus, and for all according to their needs, we ask. You, O Lord, to remember with kindness those who have some sort of ailment who are in need of healing, who are either healing from medical procedures or dealing with ongoing chronic uh, medical issues. Especially remember those who are struggling with cancer, struggling with chronic pain, uh, struggling with dementia, uh, and dealing with various uh, medical conditions, both post-operative as well as ongoing and chronic. And we know that uh, they have many crosses that they are bearing at this time. And we ask you, O Lord, to uh, be with them. If, if possible, Lord, remove the crosses that they bear, that they might find relief in you. 
uh, and in all cases, be their companion, their guard, their God. Send your Holy Spirit to comfort them each and every day, teaching them that as their Lord bore his cross patiently, so may they bear theirs and, and find relief from, uh, from their issues that, that daily uh, prove to be a challenge to them, that they might know that there comes a day when uh, their hurts will be finally healed for all eternity. Lord, in your mercy. We ask you, Lord, to be with all who are in need of your divine protection. We ask especially that you be with the military, first responders, medical caregivers, those who are in authority, those who are traveling, those who are uh, considering vocational uh, choices. And uh, we ask you to be with all who are making choices in their lives and wondering uh, what's going to happen and how you're going to lead them. And, and Lord, since all things are known to you, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to help them make the right choices, to guide them in their duties, to uh, protect them on their way, and to give them uh, a measure of mercy, even as you have shown us mercy, so that as they um, perform their duties, they do so in a way that points people to you and uh, your mercy that you have shown towards us that, that others might know that you indeed are a merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We ask you that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be taught to the joy and edification of all nations. And that uh, in your Son, especially at this time of Lent, we recognize why we uh, are sinners, why he needed to go to the cross, and uh, how we might want to amend our lives that uh, we might find different paths to walk and uh, so reflect our lives that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For these and all other prayers, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace where you choose to be present for your people, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all the creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen, from the dead, and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
continue all creation, for you have had mercy on us, and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet, in mercy, you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us, like Abraham our father, to trust in your promise, now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name, and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he gave them thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. The do as often as he drank it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <coughs> Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, bless thee and keep thee. Lord, make his face shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. Lord, lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his peace. Amen. Amen.